Earlier this week, Twitter unveiled a plan to limit QAnon activity on its platform. The company said it was taking action to try to, quote, protect the public conversation in the face of evolving threats. The FBI designated QAnon as a potential domestic extremist group last year. Jennifer Steinhauer reports for The New York Times that this year, the movement's supporters are morphing from keyboard warriors into political candidates. Jennifer is a Washington-based reporter for The Times, and she joins me now. Welcome, Jennifer. Great to have you with us. Remind us what QAnon is all about and where this belief system came from. So there's someone who claims to be um, in the intelligence apparatus of the government um, who is knows all about the so-called deep state that President Trump often talks about that has information about a broad range of conspiracies to undermine the president. And this has become sort of this loose organization that, I, I can't even say organization, a loose group of people who've started talking on things like 8chan, 4chan, talking to each other. Um, this was the sort of underpinnings, if you remember Pizzagate, where there was the belief that there was some kind of pedophilia ring happening in a New York, uh, I'm sorry, at a Washington pizza place. It has ties to conspiracy theories about Hillary Clinton, about Barack Obama. And it what's gone from sort of a underground, sort of almost cult-like group has now entered the mainstream of American politics. So, Jennifer, who are some of the current political candidates who expressed support for QAnon or sort of revealed themselves to be believers? Well, to some degree, that depends on how you define a QAnon candidate, right? Because there are many candidates who've expressed um, some sympathies for some of their theories, their conspiracy theories, and all manner of running for office um, that, that especially Democrats identify as QAnon. If you're talking about people who really um, identify with themselves with the movement, you have Marjorie Taylor Greene. She's a Georgia Republican. Um, she's uh, uh, running right now. You have Lauren, Lauren Boebert. She's the one who picked off a um, uh, like a six-term incumbent in Colorado uh, last month. Um, she has said that she hopes the theories are true. You have Angela Stanton King. She's also a House candidate in Georgia. She's repeatedly posted QAnon content on Facebook and Twitter. And just before we spoke, I went online and went on Twitter just to see if these accounts are still active their accounts for the House, and they are. Mm. So you write that these candidates have been urged on by President Trump. How is he doing that? I mean, as you pointed out, he often references the deep state himself. Right. Um, but how is he sort of winking at or even openly supporting these candidates? Um, he retweets some uh, QAnon conspiracy theorists, generally speaking, and he has retweeted some of these folks, and he's uh, tweeted congratulations to them when they've made it through their primaries and, and um, shown at least tacit support for their campaigns. Now, he shows support for lots of different uh, people running for Congress. I should note that a lot of the Republic, uh, Republicans um, in the party apparatus have tried to discourage some of these folks and tried to even support their primary opponents at times, but now they're basically stuck with them and, and that's their candidate. Yeah, the, well, that was going to be my next question. How is the larger Republican leadership, uh, you know, sort of handling this with kid gloves, I would imagine, because as, as you pointed out, some of these people make up some of uh, President Trump's base, but also don't they risk alienating the more traditional Republican who is more concerned about taxes than, you know, pedophile conspiracy rings. Right. Well, you know, some of these candidates are certainly talking about those issues, too, and they're talking about COVID. Um, and in some cases, you have a very heavily Republican district where this is very likely obviously going to be their candidate and could very well um, be joining Congress next year. In some cases, particularly in Colorado, um, it probably risks a seat that otherwise might have clearly been a safe Republican seat. So you're right. They don't want to completely alienate Republican voters who may be supporting them. They've certainly tried to push them out of primaries in some cases. But again, I mean, this is a similar to, uh, you know, I don't want to compare it to the far left and the far right and other political movements because this is something kind of very different. It's not based in some sort of ideology. It's, again, based more in conspiracy theories. But they are stuck with them in many cases. Right. It's interesting because it doesn't seem to um, have any policies that it's pushing forward. It's just more about a belief system. Is that correct? 
That's right. Um, and again, some of these, um, once you start to really peel back the onion on some of this stuff, um, you know, some of it's kind of deep state trying to undermine the president. Well, we've been hearing that from, from the president himself since almost day one. But once you start to peel back the onion on some of this stuff, there are all kinds of theories, including things about drinking certain uh, blood products of children that have certain properties. I mean, it's, it gets pretty wild. Oh, my goodness. All right. Well, Jennifer Steinauer, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Appreciate it.